Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nyson. This show is supported by our show partner, Lacole. There's no rest for the wicked, which we are indeed. Straight into Tour de Suisse Stage 1 and 2. We'll recap Stage 1, bundle it into Stage 2. Some of you might be calling us lazy for not doing a double day with Swiss and Dauphiné, but yeah, you're right, I guess. Uh, so Stage <laughs> 1 was the TT. This Tour de Suisse course is a little bit different to a one-week race. There's no... Uh, a genuine mountaintop finish. It's a lot of descent style finishes. There's two time trials. It, it's a really a course for riders like Sharkman, Full Sang, Woods, um, Alaphilippe, Carapaz, those sort of riders. And uh, they're, they're the riders we have here as well, as well as Matthew Vanderpol. You might have heard of him. And Michael Matthews, who's always had trouble in Swiss, sort of, fin- you know, behind Peter Sagan. Uh, but yeah, the TT Benji yesterday. I think Bissega was the favourite at two dollars thirty. Dennis at two eighty, and then Kung about eight to nine dollars. It was at ten point nine k flat TT at Frauenfeld. And uh, yeah, what what were the results? When it comes to the uh, top ten of this stage, we had the Swiss actually dominating the first time trial at the Tour de Suisse. So the country's probably going to be pretty happy. Number one, Stefan Kung. We had uh, an average of fifty four point five kilometers an hour which is pretty damn high Bisker in second and that was on four seconds Cataneo with a good time trial really good at the end on 12 seconds let's talk about that for like 10 seconds after the top 10 here Tom Scully um 15 seconds down on fourth Alaphilippe on fifth on 19 seconds Jonas Rutsch with a good time trial 22 seconds down and then on the same time Steimler, Vermeers and Kral Anderson so uh seven eight and nine on the 10th spot we've got Rohan Dennis who uh According to many, disappointed, but I think you had a, a feeling that it wasn't going to be a top-notch as in on the, a shorter time trial for him. Oh, I thought he'd come like fifth or something, but I looked at Kung's result in the Torreno TT, I think it was, Benji, and mm-hmm. that was a really, really good result. He came second. He came second in the San Benedetto del Tronto 10K TT behind Wafenart, six seconds behind. He beat Ghana, and I know Ghana wasn't on his best day, but still six seconds behind Van Aert. And, I mean, that's an out and back. And this one's a little bit more technical, which suits him. He's Swiss. He's, I think he's reek on the course. He hit the corners really well. Um, obviously, all Swiss people know every part of Switzerland. I mean, that's what people, <laughs> people listen. But he would have, you know, he, super motivated for the home race. I think it's a safe assumption to make. And, yeah, he was really good in the corners. I know Bissiger, the same applies to him, I guess. I mean, young guy. But I just think... I know Bissiga is nice. We were on him a little bit more. And before that Paris East TT, it wasn't a big surprise to us. That being said, that's the, you know, his best result in the TT so far. And oh, the UA two was TT was good as well, I guess. But the point is, Kung and Bissiga didn't see a big difference uh, between them going into it. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we, Dennis. Maybe just wet and corners wasn't uh, <laughs> feeling it. But yeah. the GC, there were some GC changes um, for, well, first of all, Alaphilippe Benji, fifth. Is that kind of like he sh- he's uh, showing that Tour de France stage, with, you know, the TT won the Tour de France? I think this is almost more surprising to me because it's pancake flat. Yeah, exactly. I think that a shorter time trial does fit in much more than a longer time trial, as in a 10 kilometer versus 30 kilometers on flat. So this is definitely better for him. He's got that explosivity and he can kind of push that forward to 10 kilometers in this section. 20 seconds down, 19 to be precise. Very good time trial for him, quite genuinely. And that's not the only rider from his team that did very well here. Scheimel at that seventh spot, not really worthy for GC, but very good. But Catane on the third spot, ah, he's definitely a helper, at least for Alaphilippe on this one. And he had a very strong TT in third. And what's funny about his performance is that Stefan Kung was already signing shirts like when 20 people still had to finish because he was pretty sure he was going to win. And then Cataneo came on his bike and actually rode a very good time trial. So it was at least a tiny bit scary after signing all those shirts, but I didn't have to put it in the fire or something. But uh, that's a funny detail I found. But <laughs> next to Philippe, yeah, I think that the legend himself, El Jaguar de Tulcan, rode a good TT as well. 15 von 31 seconds, man. Crazy. I mean, yeah, only two seconds behind Schachmann. He's got to be happy with that, I think, as well. Al Flip's a big surprise, big advantage for him going into the later stages on GC. Uh, the biggest other story was Dumoulin. He's back. His first race day since returning. Not his best TT, but he didn't seem to have big expectations for himself. Anyway, he, he said he's not coming in here in race-winning form. 16th on 32 seconds, and it's a flat 10K 
just over prologue length TT. He's more a 25K rolling hills type killer uh, in the TT anyway. So, yeah, just good to see him back and uh, unsurprising that that's where he sits. He's not going for GC here at all. Anything else from the TT, Benji, uh, before we head to the, the second stage? Well, I think that indeed Al Philippe was the biggest name for that. The best performance there compared to other GC riders. But looking at the star list of this race, we've got, at least I had, Carapaz and Al Philippe as potentially the winners here. And then there's quite a few other people that could compete for GC. But a Sivakov, 44 seconds down. Oh, not really? sure what to expect. It's pretty rainy in Swiss right now. And his bike handling has proven to not be his well, best quality. I'll so I'm scared for him. A minute down okay. today in stage two. So I think Sivakov yeah. GC is done. And that's a problem for him uh, as well. And, and Dennis. But yeah. yeah. Any other? Any, <laughs> I mean, yeah. On Sivakov, Benji. I mean, you, you think he's really good. But is it is it like a we're not being unfair and saying this is a problem for him now the it's a problem yeah uh, i think it's definitely a problem and it's the same thing that port and thomas have when it comes to uh rainy descents and so forth you're always scared for them you always think that it is a weakness for them and if competitors start abusing that well abusing start using that it's not abusing to use a, a weakness of someone else when it comes to uh on bike performance and uh in all honesty, the others can do so. So, um, yeah, they can use it against them. And if they do, then he might lose time for it. But to be fairly honest, I think that we've done, we've had Sivakov perform at very good levels, but it's been a bit inconsistent. And the problem is that he's always crashing before he can prove it. So it's hard to say he's, he's good or not at this point, because it's very difficult for us to like analyze that. But Pozzo Vivo, 41 seconds down on this one as well. You know, Mater, same thing. Where did Wout Pulse end on the time trial? That's something I'm very curious about. A minute 14. Did he crash? I don't know, but I recall him doing very well in a Sky time trial like years back. Uh, he's, not that, he's not that bad at TTing. Like, yeah. he, he's, he's better than Anton Poulter and Benoit Cosnefroir at TTing. That's something, something must have gone wrong there. Uh, anyway. We'll move on to stage two. So, you know, GC already alive after stage one TT from Neuhausen and Rheinfall to Lachen. 178 Ks, rolly day for the punchers. Maybe MVDP as well. It, the question would be, could the punchers do anything on the final climb? Uh, it's called the Lichtstrasse climb. 2.4 Ks, 8.3% at crest with 8 Ks to go, then descent, and then a false flat descent run in to the line before that we've sort of got 8k 4.5% 7.8k is 5.1% on the Oberrichen climb which is about 40k from the finish which does have steep sections in it these these climbs are a bit fake newsy there's like a 12% section in the uh, Goch climb and a 9% section in the uh, Oberrichen climb so a tough day and a difficult one for pure sprinters someone like Michael Matthews could be in trouble on that final climb it'd be up to de Koenig and ala philippe really to to make that final climb along with riders like shuckman and mike woods who's also here but pretty strong break benji uh went up the road of course with uh some of the team switzerland guys yes indeed we had um we had claudio imhoff in there he had a good time trial on day one as well i recall him doing well in one of these world tour races two years ago i think he got a top 15 somewhere this is from my mind so it could be wrong but then last year he didn't perform too well. So um, he is making a bit of a comeback in the uh, colors of Team Switzerland. Together with another Swiss rider, Tom Boli, for Cofidis now. It's weird seeing him ride for Cofidis after yeah. years at UAE, to be fairly honest. But next to that, we also had two riders from Rally. And it surprised me that Rally is at the start list of two of the Swiss. I'm surprised they got a wild card because it's usually pretty biased when it comes to the countries. And to see that happen, it's pretty cool to see. So in the end, I'm... Um, I'm happy to see that. I think it was Zukowski and also Delchin. Eventually, that breakaway did fall apart a bit later into the race, not on the Lichtstrasse itself, but on the climbs beforehand. And it were the rally riders who basically got, got yeah, they got dropped by uh, the other two. Tom Boli was going for the KOM points. I am not sure he actually gained them because my uh, my my ranking isn't updated yet. But I saw him win most of them, so I'm guessing that is in KOM lead right now. And uh, in second there, Imhoff tried to take a lot of the um, points as well, trying to go for it. In the end, they both got away, and it was towards the uh, 
start of the actual last Lichtstrasse that the breakaway started falling apart again and Imhoff went alone. But let's pull it back to the peloton because some stuff was happening. We had uh, some action pretty early on in the race, as in I saw Vanderpool going to the front of the peloton, going into a descent, then pacing hard in a descent. And then he went out the front and bike exchange started pacing. What was happening there? It was chaos. All day they'd been uh, sort of back and forth between FDJ, Alperson, and De Koenig. You pace, no, you pace the break back. FDJ was sort of keeping it five minutes, but they're like, well, Kuhn doesn't, doesn't suit him the finish. Then Alperson and De Koenig, Tim, Tim de Klerk were doing a fair amount of the work because they're the guys that Arthur and Van der Poel would actually want to win this stage. And yeah, it was raining like really heavily, really, really heavy rain, dark, low, cl- low clouds. Footage. Oh, yeah, footage, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to be too mean to Rai. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, footage is absolutely perfect. So credits to the Tour de Swiss host broadcaster. But on that descent off the Oberich and the longest descent left in the day, MVP went to the front, I think, for safety. And there was a split. We don't know what caused the split. But there was a split. And we were, there's an, a long valley of about 15 Ks. And we were trying to figure out who's in which group. And because we saw, we, you know, we, we perked our ears up even more because we saw well, Bex and Alperson are pacing really hard. That means someone must have been dropped. And I think it, the main person that was dropped was Dennis uh, in terms of GC. I mean, he's Pozzo done well. Vivo, man. Okay, Pozzo Vivo, but Dennis <laughs> has done well. Actually, podium to the Swiss GC as he won to yeah, the Swiss GC. But, um, and I thought he or she might have been dropped, but we couldn't see Philippe for ages. Eventually, he or she was in the main group anyway. So all the guys really contesting the stage were – going to be we're in G1 I think it was just Sivakov and Dennis that had been dropped on that, on that wet descent and so we're coming up to the Lichtstrasse of just Imhoff alone they're going to catch him on the climb for sure he's at like 20 seconds we get to the base and it's three Stevenens absolutely slaps it for Alaphilippe for 200 meters do you think that was the way to go for to Koenig Benji if your your goal is right it's drop Matthew van der Poel if you want to win the stage you want to drop him on this climb do you want Maori and Dries to set a harder pace for three quarters of it and then Alaphilippe attack at the end? Or, you know, like on in Imola, they had the French team did a pretty good job setting him up. Or do you go super hard with Alaphilippe from the base and then hope Sharkman and Woods help you? I actually found the strategy they used pretty decent because this is not like a a three kilometer climb it's a 2.4 if i remember correctly yep. yes. and we noticed at the start of the climb that marisa was setting up van der Poel just before that dave and Anne's, uh move happened and marisa was hammering it van der Poel in second position going into the lichtstrasse and then dave and Anne's hits it which causes oh uh, well him and alaphilippe to take the front and van der Poel kind of gets pushed back to like fifth seventh eighth ninth tenth fifteenth position and it's weird because I'd expect Van der Poel to have no issue with that move by Dave and Anz. So he he must have like had himself pushed back a bit or decided to go back a bit, which would be a real really weird decision. So uh, I'm guessing that he just got pushed back a bit in the group, and that caused me to think, oh no, positioning again. Please don't don't tell me that this is going to be a problem again. And Dave and Anz kept on hitting and kept on hitting and kept on hitting, and it was Ella Philippe's turn and. No, Eddie, that... Eddie Dunbar, don't disrespect Eddie. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. We'll talk about Eddie and Woods. Okay. <laughs> well, did Al Flip? I swear, Eddie, Eddie Dunbar counted, and Mike yeah. Woods was on his wheel, and I was like, "What is going on?" And I think that's. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been I've been waiting since the race finished half an hour to say it, to hype up Eddie Dunbar's <laughs> attack. It was so good. He's trying to make it hard for Carapaz in the rain. And then, yeah, Alaphilippe attacked again. And I think to Benji's point about MVP, it looked like, and this is hindsight 2020 talking, but, I mean, it seems to be the case that he tried to ride this climb steady and mm-hmm. not be baited into a big surge at the start. And that's what was happening with Alphilippe, Carapaz, Sharkman counters. Um, but then Alphilippe counters again and no one works with him. And so that's what I really wanted to ask you, Benji. Why didn't Sharkman, Woods and Carapaz work straight away with Alphilippe? Was it just a question of not having the legs? I think that if you're in that situation and you have a bit of a gap on the likes of Vanderpool that is bridging up, I think that it's a moment of like, ooh, Alaphilippe had that punch here. He made a, a big punch here. I got to his wheel because on paper, Alaphilippe is a better 
accelerative puncher than the other rider. So the other riders reach his wheel again and are like, I need like two seconds. And I don't know if it's ideal for a Carapaz to decide, oh, it's my turn now. I don't think this is the kind of stage where Carapaz needs to make that difference because Van der Poel is not his competitor for GC. So I don't see the point in Carapaz taking over here and trying to help out Alaphilippe, who's likely going to try and out sprint him for the stage anyway. Shockman then, he's the next rider. I think it's more worth for him. Wait. I think I think Shockman's yeah. he fits into your Carapaz point, and we know that from his mentality in the final. Shockman's here for GC. The parkour suits him a lot in this Tour de Switzerland. And, um, yeah, it seems that was what people were thinking. Alaphilippe really wanted the stage. The other riders were thinking a little bit about GC because Shackman then, he obviously had legs because he, he attacked right over the top. But we saw MVDP, MVDP bridging with, I think, it was, was it Frailer? It was an Astana rider he came with. He got into their group. The big name who has had a terrible run of it pretty much, disappointed since signing at Movistar, yeah. was Ivan Garcia Cortina. He was in that group and with us saying, holy, he's, he's a quick man too. So, but yeah, we that had is. a... Paris Nice 2020, but since Movistar, yep. yeah, it's oh, is that with Movistar? I can't remember. No, 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 no. Anyway, it's a, it's basically the group that Alphilippe didn't want: Carapaz, Shackman, Woods, MVDP, Ivan Garcia, Cortina, and it's uh, the big name that did get dropped though. The quick man was Michael Matthews. Anyone else I'm missing? Here she was there, but I couldn't see him, Benji. I think it was full same with MVDP, but yeah, here she. Where did he come from? Well. Uh- at some point, I thought he was dropped earlier on, and then he came back, well, in the background again. And it doesn't look like here she's on that level where he can have that acceleration to try and follow, which is which is a bit odd because acceleration was what he had the most last year. But now he just seemed to be Zubeldiaing his way towards that group again on the Lake Chirasse. And I don't know. I don't know where he came from, from in the end, but he did come back towards the end, and he surely made that group. and. Um, Maybe it's perhaps because we're not noticing him too much because of the shirt he's wearing. We're not used to it yet. Yeah, that could be it. That's a fair point. I mean, I was look. I was trying to find him, especially in the rain. It's hard to see the UAE guys as well. I find, but anyway, they get onto this descent. Um, no one's really working with anyone, and eventually, MVDP with I think three Ks to go, he just decides to attack like he did on Torino with a sort of a long straight drag of like minus three percent. Minus two percent. It's really rainy, and he just he gets an initial cap. I think Full Sang or Walt Poles was trying to close to his wheel, a Shuckman as well, and he just kept a ten meter gap. And then those guys start thinking about self preservation, which is I don't want to be the guy chasing MVP with no one <laughs> helping me because I'm just going to lose. And so he played off the other GC contenders perfectly. That's why the attack worked so well. And he got that gap. And then Alaphilippe was pretty much cooked. He'd been the most aggressive on the final climb. Everyone's looking at him. He did such a good TT. He's ahead of them on GC as well, uh, assuming that Kung, you know, Kung is dropped. So MVP playing off that and gets a gap. And it's only Shuckman that's able to bridge with him. While Poles spends ages trying to bridge, eventually gets to their wheel with like 400 meters to go. And the curious thing was, and I thought it was you know, good on him for committing to his long-term plan, Shuckman immediately pulling for MVDP once he gets to his wheel because he was thinking about putting time into Julian Alaphilippe because he's here for GC. So I thought, you know, good on him. He probably thought, if I don't pull with MVDP, I'm probably a 99% chance to losing the sprint anyway. So I may as well just keep us going. Uh, and yeah, Matthew van der Poel, He's attacked, he's hang on on the climb, and you can see him lining up Sharkman with about 250 metres to go. He jumps and it's all over. If you watch the overhead shot, the speed difference is crazy. Sharkman pretty much didn't even contest the sprint with him. He's just trying to make sure he got the bonus seconds for second if they do have them here. So Van der Poel wins the stage, a second ahead of Sharkman, four seconds ahead of Poles in a group with Garcia Cartin. Garcia, Cortina, Hirschi, Carapaz, Woods, Alaphilly, Full Sang, Crone, all on on a Crone uh, about nine seconds back. So pretty exciting stage, some yeah. big names. Remind me of Torreno. Um, <laughs> any any um, yeah, MVDP doing what he what he always does, Benji? Or, or was this a were you surprised you got over that climb so easily? Well, he and Alaphilly were my two favorites for this stage. Personally, I had their names well in my mind for this one. Um, just because Van der Poel, I'd expect him to get over 2.4 kilometer climb at 8%. It's not like it's uh, it's not like it's in a Lombardia climb, for example, where he where he has to like 
drop and then try and come back and descend afterwards. This is actually like the length that he can get over. And it, it surely was a proper performance by him, of course, because he ends up winning it. That kick from Shockman was pretty damn strong. Shockman held on for a tiny bit, but couldn't hold that at all. Garcia Cortina was actually like 20 meters behind Wout Pools or 30 meters behind Wout Pools, but made that sprint towards Wout Pools' wheel just on the line. And it was Hirschi that was just behind him there over the line as well. Carapaz tried to like close down the offense of Shockman and Van der Poel because obviously Carapaz would be like, oh, Shockman's at the front. Let's try and chase this down. Didn't really care about sprinting in the end. Just wanted to pace as much as possible. But a lot of like names that we were expecting up there, but this stage was probably a bit more GC centered than I anticipated at the beginning, probably because of the weather that it made it just a bit worse. And well, just a bit better for us, I guess. <laughs> but uh, all in all, what is notable as well is that not 22 seconds later, a group arrives with Michael Matthews winning the sprint there ahead of Serrano, who's been riding amazing this year for Movistar. Genuinely love the guy. Came from Caja, performing really well, and I look forward to seeing him ride every single time that he does. And uh, at the back of the group, Stefan Kung surviving this stage. And uh, not only surviving this stage, but finishing the stage with one second ahead in GC on Alaphilippe. So somehow this man actually survived, which is re- very good. Like this is on the level of climbing off his, off his world championships third position, I think the one where Mess Pedersen won. And I keep getting surprised by the all roundness of what Stefan Kuhn can do. The only thing he can't do is sprinting, but that's pretty clear by now. Yeah, I mean, great performance from him, finishing so close behind. Maybe the wet conditions, he seems to relish them as well. It's going to be another difficult day for him tomorrow to keep that jersey, though. Uh, the GC standings now, uh, he's got one second ahead of Alaphilippe, two seconds ahead of Shuckman. Shuckman makes up about eight or nine seconds on Alaphilippe after the TT. Van der Poel fourth on six seconds, then Garcia Cortina Cataneo, Carapaz on 13 seconds, then Paulus, Meda, and Krohn. Uh, so... Carapaz doing well. I mean, he's, he's. I mean, he's can't be disappointed with the position he's in after the TT in today's stage. Tomorrow, 182 k's from Lachen to Fafnau. Rolly again, but not as steep. Like there's not a climb like today's stage, which is you know right before the finish, 2.4 k's, eight percent. The closest extended climb is the. Um, Stala Strasse, 3.4K, 6%. It is up and down, I'll give you that, but it's 25K from the finish. And I think it's going to be a sprint between Matthews and Matthew van der Poel if van der Poel doesn't decide to attack first. I'm trying to look who else is quick here that could get over that. Mayus, Jordi Mayus won't get over that. Fred Wright and Stephen Williams, maybe they're pretty quick. Cortina um, for a top five, perhaps? Yeah, Cortina for a yeah as well. Uh, do you think MVP wants this to be a bunch sprint uh, between he and Matthews? Well, uh, to be fairly honest, I don't think that Van der Poel is going to get over the monster climbs that are coming in the last uh, few days. So I'm guessing that he's here to go for the stages. So I don't think he cares whether it's a sprint or whether it's him riding away at some point. But I think that a sprint is more likely the way that it's going to end. Because... If he has to make a move already to try and split it up, he needs to do it on that uh, whatever you called it. <laughs> am I gonna stressor. am I gonna give it a try? Okay, glad that you uh, took it on here. And that's it's it's still a while from I'm the finish line to be honest. I got it wrong as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a while from the from the from the end of the stage. And if he goes there already, it would be typical typical Vanderpool and the only situation where I see that happening if it's absolutely raining like today perhaps that's when I see an early attack perhaps happening but ah I don't see it happening genuinely and I think that we're indeed gonna see either a sprint finish reduced bunch or a miscalculation where a breakaway rider ends up ends up winning like a bissiger or something you never know because Stefan Kung won stage like this in in to the Swiss or a stage like this into the Swiss before as well in 2017 or something. And um, yeah, just a lot of these situations in the Tour de Swiss where a stage does end with a solo breakaway rider taking the victory. And on paper though, Bike Exchange should be taking control, I'd expect. They did it today, so why would they not do it tomorrow on a stage that 
on paper, well, fits him just as much because I would have expected Matthews to fit on today's stage as well. But it might have been a bit too close to the finish line, the, uh, the punchy climb nonetheless. But uh, I actually have a topic for you. Or do well, you have I think, something to add for this? I just first? think it wouldn't surprise me if Van der Poel attacks with 17 k's to go on the Alt Buron, 700 mm-hmm. meters at 7.4%. Then it's descent for about five or more than that for about 10 kilometers. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me to see Van der Poel attack on the Alt Buron section. Uh, I think his punch there could be a good option. But yeah, what's, what, what question do you have for me? A little fun question for you and I. Uh, it's a bit of a, a similar question to the one I had uh, on our Dauphiné podcast. So for a stage like today, it's the same like a stage with cobbles and a Grand Tour, for example. You've got Movistar with a rider like Garcia Cortina who can go for the stage. And you've got Soler for a GC. Is there, do you find it worthy for Cortina to go for the stage? Or do you think that he should have been waiting for Soler there to try and bring him back at the end? Oh, nah, you got to let Cortina go for the stage. Like that's what he, that's pretty much why they signed him to go for stages like this. I mean, Soler, he did a bad TT, didn't he? I mean, if he if he's up there on GC like really close, where where did he finish? He finished a minute and six seconds back. Nah, sorry. Yeah, if you if you finish easy, yeah. if you finish a minute back. Ivan gets to go for the stage. Yep. Sorry, Mark. Um, I, th- <laughs> I think it's better for Soler to go for stages himself. Like there's one stage, yep. um, stage five suits him. If he does a descent attack, um, I mean, he's a great descender in the wet. I think the one I think uh, he can win, oh, it's, it's up. Nah, maybe it's a bit hard from the break if he loses enough time on GC. But, yeah, he's a great descender Mark Soler, it seems. Um, he's good in wet conditions like we saw at Romandy. I think he should just go for stages at this point, uh, being so far back on, on GC. But yeah, pretty pretty interesting parkour from the Tour de Suisse. We've got anything further to add, uh, Benji? I think everyone should you should tune in. It finishes pretty late if you knock off work early. It could be another MVP Philippe showdown, uh, which is something to, yeah, don't take it for granted, <laughs> seeing things like that, even though they are, you know, that happens so often. But yeah, anything else, Benji? Yeah, I think that any race that Van der Poel is at suddenly makes it much more interesting for me. And that's because he lightens up, well, cycling for me. And I think for many people. And I think he made today's stage more fun than if he wasn't here as well. So I um, I look forward to seeing tomorrow. I look forward to seeing the rest of the Tour de Suisse. I find the parkours of the Tour de Suisse really, really intriguing. The mountain stage that are coming are are yeah, splendidly made and um, I'm hoping to see some action there from like uh, our uh, our favorite here on the podcast now Hagwar the Tulkan when it's raining yeah. and um, I hope to see him ride very well so that Ineos has trouble at the end of the Swiss to decide who's their actual leader <laughs> for the tour <laughs> and then we can like start speculating <laughs> about who it is and then it's some, someone completely different a fourth rider in the Ineos train in uh, the tour that actually becomes the leader. Carlos, I don't know, Rohan Carlos Dennis. Rodriguez, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down for it. <laughs> can they do a mid-season transfer for Mark Padun? How much, like in football, they can say, hey, we'll pay you 5 million euro for Mark Padun for one well, year. They did just... it for Dennis, right, a few years ago? No, they didn't uh, do it then. No, Bahrain? No. no, Bahrain cut him mid-season, but Inigal suddenly signed him at the end of the no, season. No, the... The transfer beforehand that Dennis. Oh went to no! Bahrain yeah, 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 yeah. Or... With with Volters. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Wasn't that? Yeah, with from Garmin to BMC or something. I don't don't know, fully what... remember, but it was something. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right, that's enough for today. We'll see you with the uh, MVDP victory tomorrow uh, as scheduled. Ciao.